Um, I'm here to talk to you today about a distributed system library that we built at Comcast called Sirius that we use for managing uh, application reference data. Uh, I'm going to begin by talking about what we mean by reference data. So uh, a reference data set is one where your application needs to have frequent access to it, but for which your application is not the primary system of record, right? So this is uh, data that's available somewhere else, um, and from your application's point of view, your application really just has a read-only relationship with that data. Now, uh, uh, the, another characterization of the type of reference data that we're talking about is that uh, the data set is largely static, meaning that um, the rate of updates to it is, is not very high with respect to the overall database. Um, at the same time, uh, we do care about seeing the updates and uh, we want to get them at some point, but again, because our application is at arm's length from the system of record, we can tolerate a little bit of propagation delay, right? So as the system of record is updated, we can tolerate a little bit of latency before it shows up at our application. In our case at Comcast, uh, a major reference data set is the world of TV and movie entertainment metadata. So these are things like what year did the movie, was the movie Casablanca released? Or how many episodes were in season seven of Seinfeld? Or when is the voice going to be on TV next and on what channel? Um, and so uh, one of the things that we began to realize, especially um, fairly recently, is that um, as main memory sizes have been increasing for commodity application servers, this reference data set started to look like it was gonna fit into memory. I mean, in fact, uh, when we started looking around, we found that, hey, there's a lot of reference data sets that are maybe not as big um, as, as we once considered them to be. So uh, a good example is the, uh, the, the encyclopedias that I actually show here. Um, anybody remember actually using the physical ones? So this is good in another sense in that, uh, I don't know if you remember, but every year you would get like the yearbook that would come out at the end, um, which were the set of updates that had happened since the original encyclopedia was built. And so that's a good example of the update rate um, being relatively low with respect to the overall data set. So when I, if I condense the Encyclopedia Britannica down to DVDs, this is only 4.2 gigabytes, right? So, so easily fits uh, into main memory. We say, oh, well, that's well and good. This is, but this is ancient reference data technology, right? So um, let's look at something a little bigger. Um, if I were to take all of the English language Wikipedia articles uh, download them in XML format, which of course is not the world's most concise data format. Um, and in fact, not even compressed, right? So this is uncompressed XML. That's only 43 gigabytes. Um, I can take my credit card and spin up an EC2 instance that has six times this RAM um, right now. So, uh, and, and our reference data set that we were using is, is, is not even this big. So, this led us to think about, hey, maybe there's a different application architecture we can be using for accessing this reference data set. So the traditional architecture here is that I have my application server with my business logic in it, um, and I've placed my reference data off in some external data store. And my application then issues queries um, to go fetch the reference data that it needs. Um, now, a familiar problem here is that there's an impedance mismatch, right? So my application wants to deal with native data structures like objects, sets, maps, arrays, things of that sort, but the data is actually stored in a different format, right? Maybe it's laid out in documents in a NoSQL database or laid out in a relational format um, in a traditional RDBMS. Um, and so it's often the case that we add an object relational mapper to try to uh, sort of mitigate that impedance mismatch. Um, now, anybody who's ever actually tried to tune the queries in production that, that one of these ORM layers generates uh, might actually expand that acronym to uh, obscuring the real mechanism. Um, and so, uh, but, but, but either way, either with or without the ORM layer, um, our application developers have to spend their time thinking about uh, the various failure scenarios that happen here, right? So I have to care about timeouts, I have to care about exceptions, cache misses, connection pool settings. Um, these are all things that you have to pay a lot of attention to to build a robust production service, but they are easy to forget, um, to, to take a look at, um, and they're hard to get right. Um, and so uh, we began wondering if maybe there was a better way, because a lot of the effort here has nothing to do with the reference data set, and it certainly doesn't have very much to do with the application logic that we're trying to provide. So um, let's fast forward. So we have a, uh, an application server. It has a large amount of memory with respect to this reference data set. Um, the most convenient way 
to have access to the reference data is if it's actually just sitting in process in native data structures, right? Then I don't have to do any I.O. to get access to it from my program. Um, and so um, in this setting, now my application developers start to be concerned with the data structures and algorithms that you use for getting access to this data. They can write unit tests that don't require mock objects um, to sort of hide I.O. Um, while they're testing the application logic. Um, and, and profilers actually become useful again. Right? The traditional application server architecture is often I.O. bound. Um, so a profiler doesn't tell you very much about your application's performance. Um, if, it, if the data is actually local and we're using you know, the algorithms we learned in sort of our early CS classes, then we have an opportunity to apply some of these tools again. So uh, what we set about doing was seeing if we could um, make this model real. Right? So this is the model that we wanted to provide to developers. We wanted to make it easy for them to achieve this um, and, uh, and to still uh, keep this sort of mirror of the reference data set up to date. So one of the first things that we did was we inverted the relationship between the system of record and our application server. So instead of pulling data from the system of record, instead we turn that around and we publish updates into the application cluster. Um, and this has the nice property that um, it decouples the availability of these systems. Um, so if the system of record uh, becomes unavailable for some point in time, um, it doesn't affect my application's availability. My reference data become, starts to become stale as I don't get updates coming in. But as I mentioned before, for a lot of these reference data sets, the application can really tolerate um, a lot of that latency for seeing those updates. So this ends up being a, a net win. So we produced this, uh, this library called Sirius. And the way that this works is it divides your application into sort of two rough components. So uh, as, a, as an update um, from, uh, gets published into the system, um, that gets published into sort of a particular interface that you provide in your application. So a lot of the uh, places where we use this are in uh, HTTP-based web services, right? So we define a specific endpoint where the updates can get published in. Application then <clears throat> turns around and hands that off to the serious layer. Um, and uh, we model the updates as key value updates. So it's either a put um, of, a, of a value to a key or it's a delete, which disassociates any existing values from that key. The serious layer then turns around um, and talks to the serious library layer in the other members of the cluster. Um, so it runs pa the Paxos protocol here to establish a globally consistent ordering and basically give every, assign all of the update sequence numbers. Uh, in addition, it persists the updates as they come in um, to a local transaction log. Um, and so this transaction log, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment, um, but this can be used to recover from application uh, restarts. Uh, once those two steps have completed, then uh, the library turns back around and invokes an application-provided callback, uh, which is a request handler. And so the idea is that here, the put or delete comes back to your application, and Sirius essentially says, now is the time to apply this um, to your in-memory copy. So, so essentially, it's, it's very easy logic um, to see the updates coming in and then to update your native data structures. Um, the transaction log, um, when the application starts, essentially just uses the same request handler to rebuild um, the data set from scratch, right? So Sirius just spools those updates back through the request handler to rebuild uh, the in-memory mirror. Now on the read path, uh, we actually don't go through Sirius at all. So uh, when an actual client request, and this is a request that's actually related to the functionality that uh, the application has provided, when that comes in, we just read directly from the native data structures. Um, so it doesn't involve Sirius at all. So um, a as you might imagine, this means that we have eventual consistency around the reference data set, right? Because the reads don't go through the same uh, sort of strong consistent ordering that the updates do. We do get eventual consistency because all of the, all of the applications do apply the updates in the same order. Um, due to the sequence numbers that we're assigning. So um, what we typically do, um, as we said before, is so we have this, uh, this external system of record, um, that small guy off to the, to the right-hand side. Um, and it's publishing updates. We typically route those through a load balancer so that the external system doesn't have to know how many, uh, how many application servers are available. And so these run Paxos and assign the sequence numbers. Um, and we typically use that for ingest. So we set up a, a cluster of server for ingest. Now, uh, the serious layer also implements a catch-up protocol so that um, if uh, a server is down for some period of time or it loses one of the update messages, there's a way to recover those lost updates. 
um, because the sequence numbers are sequential, um, we know an application can tell when it's missing one. Um, and so there's a protocol that's there for fetching missing updates uh, from a peer node. So what this also lets us do is set up um, downstream dependent clusters that use that same catch-up protocol, um, but instead of participating in Paxos, they're just pulling the updates um, from the upstream uh, cluster. Um, and so, um, and in fact, this can result in very flexible topologies. So you can actually chain um, different clusters to each other or have them branch out in a tree, uh, for example. And, uh, and so this is nice because um, because of uh, Paxos is a strong consistency uh, protocol, there's pressure because the more machines that you add to that pool, the lower your throughput is, right? Which is, I mean, they have to agree. That's why it's a consensus protocol. Um, on the other hand, we want to scale this out um, to serve um, lots and lots of users. And so by decoupling things in this fashion, um, we, we resolve that tension, right? Because we want a small number to get our ingest throughput up, but we want a large number to serve all the, all the read sides. Uh, the last piece of bookkeeping that the Sirius library takes care of is managing the, that local transaction log. So um, as I mentioned before, we model these as key value updates. And so one of the things that we're able to do here is we're able to compact the transaction log because we just need the most recent update to any given key. Um, and so uh, the way that this works is uh, we segment the transaction log. So uh, as the updates are coming in, we're filling up segments to a maximum size, then starting the next segment and so on. In the background, we come back around to the older segments, which are no longer being written, um, and we can go and compact them, right? So the first one may have multiple references to a given key, and so we can remove and just keep the last one. Um, similarly, we can move to the next segment and compact it with respect to all of the older ones as well. And so uh, over time, while you're running, this compaction is going on in the background. Um, and so when you, if you do have an application restart, say for code deployment, um, then the set of data that's in the transaction log, uh, it largely represents the most current version of the reference data set. Uh, Sirius is implemented uh, in Scala using the ACA actor system library. Um, and this ended up being a very important choice for us. Um, we chose the Paxos protocol because it is so well studied and understood in the literature, um, but we had not implemented it before. Um, and so we based our implementation on uh, a paper by Robert Varaness called Paxos Made Moderately Complex. Um, and so, so this, uh, this paper contains uh, pseudocode for the algorithm that describes a bunch of cooperating processes. Um, and, um, and it turned out that um, when we, we could very straightforwardly translate this into Scala and Akka, where there's a very clear correspondence between the pseudocode in the original paper and, um, and, and, our, and this is the actual production code uh, from, from the corresponding part. Um, in the library. Um, there's a few additions, you know, it's, you know uh, there was no mention of exception handling, um, for example, uh, but, um, but in terms of understanding the basic logic, this was actually a very key design choice uh, that we found. Um, and so, uh, just to wrap up, um, uh, Sirius is currently being used by multiple services um, at Comcast. So, so we've had multiple internal development teams that have opted into using Sirius for managing the reference data sets. Um, and so, uh, so it currently powers a number of things behind our next generation uh, uh, television experiences that run across set-top boxes, uh, laptops, uh, tablets, and things of that sort. Uh, we've been running it in production for almost two years now. Um, and so it's been working really well for us. So in summary, um, the, the, the key contribution that Sirius provides is that it gives our developers access to the reference data in native arbitrary data structures. Um, our, a, a lot of what our, we want our developers focusing their time on delivering new features um, or modifying existing ones. And so because so many of our features, um, especially in a television experience, um, have to deal with that reference data set of television, of entertainment metadata, we want them to spend as little time as possible working on the plumbing behind that. Right? So we want to make it very easy for them to have access to the data and uh, test it and deliver new features. Um, as I mentioned before, um, Sirius provides for eventually consistent replication. Um, this is important from uh, sort of an operational sanity point of view. Um, everybody likes to avoid divergent uh, distributed systems. Um, but the library itself handles persistence and replay. Um, and so that 
uh, that sort of bookkeeping and heavy lifting is taken out of the responsibility of the application developers. Um, and it's available in a convenient library interface that has relatively transparent semantics. So as I mentioned before, as an application, you hand off a put or delete to Sirius, and then a put or delete comes back to you. So it's very easy to understand how the data flows through the system. Finally, we've, uh, we've actually open sourced uh, our library, um, made it available on our GitHub account under an Apache 2 license. Um, so we'd be very interested to, uh, to hear everybody's feedback about that. Um, and uh, with that, I'm, I'm very happy to take any questions. Hi, when you started talking about the uh, main memory database, essentially, I started looking in the, trying to find this in the proceedings to see how it compared to related work, and I couldn't find your paper in the proceedings, and I was wondering if this is an accident or by intent, but the, the, uh, it's the one in, in the list of you know, the, uh, the program, all the other ones show the paper, and this one only links the abstract, so is that just an accident? Uh, I think that's just an accident. Um, so when I went to the, uh, the technical sessions on the website, um, our, our PDF of the paper is linked there. Okay, it wasn't there f 10 minutes ago. Okay, well, so we, I mean, we can clearly right. take this offline. Right. I swear we wrote so, a paper. Okay, so can you, can, can you say something about the, uh, the related work then? Yeah, so... The, you mentioned Paxos, but what about all the other in-memory? Yeah, so, there, so there's, there's, um, there's definitely a, a long... There is a long related work section in the paper. Um, you know, we tried to, uh, as, as, as a good engineer will try to do, we tried to build on the shoulders of giants. So... Um, a lot of the in-memory systems that we saw didn't have the exact set of design trade-offs that we were looking for. So, um, so a lot of them either um, involved, um, still had that impedance mismatch, right? So if it's an embedded database, right, I still have the, the sort of query mismatch. I don't get my native data structures. Um, or it's held in an external process where I still have to manage either IPC or IO to go get it. Um, so, um, so the, you know, again, the, you know, we, we looked around and there are a lot of things in this area. Um, one of the key differences is that um, it's not just about holding things in memory um, for performance reasons. I mean, obviously that's, that beats, um, in many cases, going and, and doing I.O. to get access to the data. Um, but rather, it's um, a lot of our focus is around the convenience for the developers. Um, and so like, having access in those native sets and maps and lists and arrays uh, was sort of a big productivity win for us. So one of your requirements, actually right here, is uh, eventual consistency on servers, and you end up getting that with your two-layer Gooby. Um, I'm sorry, with, with my two-layer what? With, with your two-layer with your two -layer structure. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, but um, why did you actually end up using Paxos rather than an eventual consistency protocol in the bottom layer? Yeah, so, um, so one of the main reasons, again, that I mentioned that, uh, that we chose Paxos, and, and work on this began uh, several years ago. So, for example, it predates um, uh, protocols like Raft, for example. Um, so it was, this is a protocol that's very well studied in the literature. Um, so uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Kyle Kingsbury. He's a developer at a startup in San Francisco, but he's been publishing a bunch of blog posts related to, um, to sort of distributed databases and, and how well they manage consistency. So so, um, so we went with sort of the tried and true Paxos protocol. Um, it could well be that an alternative protocol there was, um, you know, is also possible. But here, this was one that was easy for us to reason about. Um, where, hey, if I if we run Paxos, um, it's very easy to understand, and, and we use that to assign sequence numbers. It's very easy to understand how we get eventual consistency out the other end. Um, so, um, so that was the, our, one of our main motivations. So a good, good talk. Um, I just had a question about the um, kind of the, the limits of the applicability here. It seems like you, there's a number of special properties uh, for this application. It's a relatively small database. Um, you can tolerate stale data, and the update rate seems to be fairly low. So you know, given those constraints, yeah, I can see how you know you came up with this design. But I, I think it's worth keeping in mind that, you know, it's, it's not in, in a different scenario or, you say, a higher update rate or a need for, uh, you know, more um, uh, timely data that this wouldn't necessarily be applicable. Oh, yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, and so, you know, we don't, 
we have plenty of data, other data sets ourselves that, that we don't manage this way. Right. Um, and so um, we're very careful in the paper to lay out the parameters that you know we define as a reference data set where we yeah. think this is applicable. Yeah. Um, so yes, while certainly not every data set would fall into that category, um, our feeling is that, and our experience has been that there are lots, there, there actually are lots of data sets that, that where this is applicable. Yeah. Also, there's something wrong with my cable box at home. I don't know if you could drop by that or not. So if you're serious, you should come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> I might be too. Oops, sorry.